Well, good afternoon. I'm so happy to be here with my great friend, Anita. And, you know, we've been friends for so long. About 15 years ago, we met at the National Women's Studies Conference. So I'm excited today to just kind of talk about some of your uh, articles that you've written over time. And um, if you could just introduce yourself, like where do you teach? Where are you located now? Hi, Beverly. Thank you for um, inviting me to participate in this. Uh, my name is Anita Tijerina Revilla. I am located in Long Beach, California. I've been here a couple of years. I came to teach at Cal State LA in the fall of 2019, and I had been teaching in Las Vegas for 15 years before that, but I'm originally from Texas. I was born and raised in San Antonio. So you're, a lot of the work that you do focuses on um, education and activism, and those are things that, you know, you've personally been involved in that are close to your heart. So where does your educational story begin? Yeah, I think one of the reasons that I decided to do education was because by and large, my community and my family have not had access to an equitable education. We have been literally the people who have been left behind, who have been pushed out of institutions of education. So I, as a small child, was um, identified as a smart, smart kid. And so I was uh, tracked early on into um, gifted and talented and eventually into a college track. But that wasn't true for many of my my, um, my friends and my siblings and family members. And so along the way, I realized that I was being targeted as one of these children to go to college. Um, and I, I received the messages that if I went to college, I could get my whole family out of poverty, that I could help my whole community, right? And so this was one of the goals that my mom had instilled in me, that if I went to college, that I could help all of us. And that was something that was delivered to her from local Latino politicians. Um, and so uh, it wasn't until much later that I realized that there were some contradictions in that, but I became uh, very committed to being this very um, high achieving child. And so I um, joined every um, you know, honors class that I could. I, got, got, um, I, I became um, a member of every extracurricular activity that I could. I went to all the summer programs and I, got to go to an Ivy League school. And mind you, no one in my family had gone to college. So to go to Princeton University, um, the first in my family to go to college was a really big deal. So I came from San Antonio, which is a you know a big city. Um, smil feels like a small town, but it's a big city. Uh, San Antonio is 70% or more Mexican and Mexican-American. Much of my family had been in Texas even before it became part of the United States. Right. And so um, we have long roots. Even my great, great grandparents were born in Texas. And another thing that we'll be talking about today is just the terminology used uh, to, divine, to define certain groups. But how was it growing up? Like how what was the terms that your community latched on to? Yeah. So um, I grew up being called either Mexican, Mexican-American, uh, a Texan people in Texas, you know, are very much attached to their Texan identities. Uh, for those of us with Mexican background, we're called Tejanos or Tejanas, um, which is literally a Mexican Texan, um, and then also Hispanic, right? And as we know now, Hispanic uh, was an identified term through the census um, to to put all of us, all, all Spanish speaking origin people um, under one category, they were trying to, the US uh, census was trying to categorize all people of Latino descent under that one category. So it wasn't a self-chosen term mm -hmm. and it also prioritized the Spanish colonization as our connection. That's a really important point because especially as a sociologist, we really rely on um, you know, how the government basically creates categories in order to count people and, and, you know, measure them. And so we can see like over time and over geography, these terms change. And so, you know, even, um, you know, the multiracial category was only introduced 20 years ago or so. So it's really good to know, you know, especially for our sociology students, just where these terms come from. 
it comes from the government imposed or it comes from the community as a self-identifier. But first, you know, your article, um, Understanding Latina Latino School Pushout, Experiences of Students Who Left School Before Graduating. I mean, this is examining just this, um, you know, background of, of what you're talking about as far as the relationship with this community and the, and the educational institution. So could you just kind of summarize, um, you know, your research in this article? Yeah, so I um, co-authored that article with my colleague, Nora Luna. And one of the things that we, uh, that I've been doing for the past 20, 20 to five years, I would say, is looking at the experiences of Latino, Latina, Chicano, Chicana students in what we call the educational pipeline, right? And so we acknowledge that um, when students, uh, Latino, Latino and Latina students, Latinx, we're using Latinx now for gender inclusion and Chicanx students, um, they start out, um, you know, at, at elementary school and their numbers dwindle as they go forward in, um, in education. So as they move into higher education, their numbers literally drop in half or in, you know, in, in multitudes. Uh, but this particular piece looks at Nevada and the experiences of students there. And what we were trying to show again is that students um, have traditionally been looked at from a deficit theory perspective. And um, these deficit theories have generally blamed the student, their parents, their family, their communities. Um, they blamed those, the specific person for their quote failure. Um, and what the what deficit theories uh, don't do is they don't look at structural inequalities, things like racism, classism, sexism, homophobia, right, anti-immigrant sentiment that we term citizenism, right. And so we know that if you are a marginalized person in this country, your educational experience is not easy, and we believe that the educational system has an obligation to holding you in the school, to, to meeting your needs, right? Mm -hmm. And so that includes bilingual education, it, it includes uh, culturally relevant pedagogy, it includes teachers who care, right? That's a bottom line. Like if your teacher does not care about you, mm -hmm. if they don't want to see you succeed, if your counselors don't believe in you, um, then they can be responsible for pushing you out of school, right? Mm -hmm. So we reject terminology that only puts the onus on students. Mm -hmm. And instead we use terminology that looks at the structural inequalities that have led students to make the decision to leave. So when a student leaves school, we don't call them a dropout, mm -hmm. we call them a push out because we do believe that many of them have uh, visions and dreams of completing their education, but along the line, from elementary school to middle school to high school, um, especially marginalized students living in poverty, immigrant students, queer and trans students. Um, a lot of these students uh, and undocumented students, they, they have experienced so much trauma by the time they even get to fifth grade um, or by the time they get to sixth grade, many of those students are, are thinking about leaving the school system. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that cultural social reproduction where it was never people's intention to get working class and poor people into um, professional and higher education right. spaces, right? And so so I think what we're trying to do is bring light to the fact that this, these are things that have been taking place for centuries and, and they're even more um, impacting the more marginalized your social categories and social identities are in this society. And so we're trying to bring light to the way, the specific weight, way that it impacts Latinos and Latinas and Chicanos and Chicanas in this country. And again, my one of my things that I like to focus on is how it impacts immigrant students, mm -hmm. um, feminists, you know, queer and, and women, uh, queer trans and women students, uh, because oftentimes those are the students who are at the uh, forefront of the activism, right? The student yeah. activism that has led to some of the changes that, is hap that are happening today. So, I mean, that's my own story, right? You, right. Talk, you, you asked me about what happened, how did I go to Princeton? My mother 
was harshly discriminated against in school. And she always says, I can't believe my daughter's a, te- a professor, right? Like she hated school. She hated her teachers, but she had racist um, nuns who taught her in Catholic school who literally uh, punished her, sometimes hit her with rulers. I mean, this is within our lifetime, right? People think that that stuff happened a long time ago, but my mother was hit, you know, on her hands and, and on her back um, for speaking in Spanish at school, right? And so you think about like, why do I do this work? I do this work because it's in my genetics, right? It's in my, it's in my cells. And it's also been taught to me that um, not everyone has had the same opportunities and, and those opportunities have been given very scarcely for people of color. And so when people like me, uh, people like Michelle Obama, you know, get to go to Princeton, right? A black or brown person um, who's not necessarily a wealthy person, that doesn't mean that they, that racism, is, uh, you know, doesn't exist or that every other black or brown person should, ha- should be able to do this. It means that they only let a few of us in so that others will believe <laughs> in this American dream that we know now is a fallacy, right? And many scholars are like pointing to how that American dream has, um, manipulated so many um, both immigrants and people of color into believing and even working class white people into believing that we all have access to wealth when we don't. Right. And as a sociologist, I always want to point out to my students that, of course, our educational system is tied to our property tax system, which just ensures that you know rich neighborhoods have well-funded schooling and the opposite. Whereas we could really, you know, change these kinds of structures in our society. If we wanted more equality in our society, we could make our educational systems funded in a different way that's a lot more equal and really bring kind of an equal education. But by tying it to these property values, then we just ensure that educational systems actually reproduce the inequalities that are already established in our society. Absolutely. But then, of course, we turn around and, and yeah, like you said, point to the few tokens that actually make it through and say, well, if they did it, if, if you just work hard enough or want it hard enough, then you can get it. And so that's a really powerful narrative in our society. But it's also really damaging, like you said, because it makes people think like, well, I guess I didn't work hard enough. I didn't want it bad enough. It's my fault that I didn't really um, resist all this, these things that are around me. Mm-hmm. You know, I want to just, you know, give a um, quick shout out to, to my colleagues and my advisor, Danny Solorsono, who is, uh, you know, professor of critical race theory and education at UCLA. He literally has been responsible for creating a critical mass of, of critical scholars, right, um, including in, students of color or now faculty of color um, who are putting forward like these, you know, these stories, these these um, theories that are really um, put shedding light on all of these inequalities, right? So he, um, he and our other colleagues are the ones who um, are investigating like, you know, these theories about, you know, um, community cultural wealth, um, with Tara Yoso talks about community cultural wealth. They started with the pipeline, for example, they talked about transformational resistance, they talked about uh, microaggressions, right? So like, uh, if students are interested in learning more about critical perspectives of education, like there are a lot of scholars that come out of these programs or are being mentored in these um, arenas by people who have come out of these CRT education scholar um, camps and they're all over the country now. I mean, and again, to, to, to situate myself in it, like my school was under source. It was extremely underfinanced. It was one of the poorest in the, in the whole city. Um, and we didn't even have advanced placement classes because our, our school didn't believe that we could pass those, that we could, you know, that we were interested in them or that we would pass those classes. And so the teachers that offered honors courses, they did it because they were, um, 
out of the goodness of their heart they, and because they were um, arguing to the administration, we have to offer honors courses. So this is how bad it was. My, um, my history teacher, he, he was told, if you wanna teach an honors class, you have to teach your regular class and your honors class. So I had one class, this was my, my world history class, where half the class was a regular class and half the class was an honor class, honors class in the same period. He had to teach one side regular history <laughs> and one side honors history. And I asked him, why did you have to do this? He said, because the people at the top wouldn't, didn't believe that you all could do this, you know, um, this honors class. I wanted to teach you AP and they wouldn't let me do that. So at least I could offer you an honors class and this is the only way I could do it. So he had to do double the work and, and had to go out of his way to teach us. And then the other thing that I noticed is he had a Mexican American history um, mm. like book and, and, and poster in his class. And I asked him, what is that? Why do you have that? He said, oh, I used to teach Mexican American history, but they don't want me to teach it anymore. And I said, why? He said, well, they don't, be they don't believe in, in that. They don't believe that you all should be learning that. Mm -hmm. So this is the kind of, um, you know, stuff that I talk about this, like if we were ch teaching ethnic studies and culturally relevant work to a 99% Mexican American school, then maybe more students would feel connected to their curriculum, to their to their teachers and to a lifelong, you know, educational um, goal. But because the, the curriculum doesn't connect to their lives in any way, and the, the expectations about whether or not they'll go to college are so low, again and again, we heard nobody want, expects you to go to college. When we got into college, they told us, like, we are very, you know, like, we're surprised that you're even wanting to apply to college. I went to my counselor multiple times to ask her for fee waivers to go to, to apply to Princeton, to Harvard, to Yale, because... I had done a summer program where the other kids told me, oh, you should go to these schools. And I was like, I don't know if I can go. Like, I really didn't even think that I could get into these schools. And they were like, if you're at this program, we're going to Harvard, we're going to Yale, you know, we're going to Stanford. And I, again, I didn't even know what these schools were back then. Um, but they told me, we're going there and you should try to go too. So I went back in my senior year, the end of or the beginning of my senior year, and I said, I need fee waivers for these schools. And she literally tried to talk me out of applying to the schools. She said, I, and this was the, the, the counselor that was supposed to help us apply, fill out the applications and everything. Um, she said, why don't you consider instead going to one of the state schools in, in San Antonio? And I said to her, why don't you just give me the fee waivers and I'll apply myself. So I applied to 13 undergraduate schools because I just didn't know if I could get in. I had no idea, but I thought one of these is bound to take me <laughs> and one of these is bound to pay my way because I couldn't pay. And so I got into, I think, 10 of the 13. So did you apply by yourself? Did she help? I applied you? everything by myself. Wow. Every last application, every last, you know. Like before the internet, too. Exactly. I had to type <laughs> everything up. I oh, had my to, goodness. Wow. Everything. And you had to figure it out, like, without. I had to figure just, it out all by myself. So that is push out. Right. That and literally, right. I someone it. telling some authority figure who whose profession this is to know this stuff telling you that you shouldn't do that. I mean, that's a hugely powerful message to you. How could you possibly have the gumption to go against a professional with her professional knowledge? And mind you, I was ranked um, in the top 10. I was between two and three uh, most of my time in high school. So if I was in the top five of, of my graduating class and I was being treated this way, you can only imagine what the rest of the school was being treated like. Right. Absolutely. And if you look at um, the, the vast um, kind of groups of community cultural wealth that have been identified, linguistic 
Um, capital is one of them. Mm-hmm. Um, aspirational capital is one of them, right? So my mom's dreams, even though she had been pushed out of school um, herself, and she had been told that she was, you know, that she shouldn't go to school or that she wasn't good enough to go to school, um, she still had high aspirations for us. She still wanted me to go to college. She wanted me to go to the best college, and she thought that I could do anything that I wanted to, right? She believed that, and so her dreams and aspirations were a form of capital, right? And so that's that's the truest kind of capital for pe- marginalized people, the, the kind that gives you the hope in the face of so much tribulation. But you have either your family or your community, or, you know, it could be a grandparent, it could be a best friend, it could be that one teacher, right? Or a student organization. A lot of people find strength in student organizations or student activism. Another capital is resistance capital, right? That I see that as the organizations that people join, especially activist organizations, because people find cultural relevancy in activist organizations. They find connection and sense of belonging. When they don't have a sense of belonging in schools, they find it outside. Yeah, I also earned a master's in women's studies. And really, it wasn't until college and then graduate school when I got to study women's history. But it wasn't until my master's degree when I discovered a history of Asian Americans uh, and Asian American studies. And it was just really upsetting to realize that I've gone through my entire, you know, primary, secondary education. And I never even knew that Asians had a history in the United States. And so um, if I had learned that in grade school or earlier, I would have felt a lot more engaged and and part of the the community and also the educational system. Yeah, so um, Mr. Arevalo, that's the same teacher who taught taught half history, regular history and taught half um, honors history. So you can see that he was one of my biggest um, inspirations and mentors. Mr. Arevalo, he was really like this tough love type person sometimes, right? So he he told us early on, this was my sophomore year in high school. He said, out of this class, half of you will drop out. He was using dropout language, right? Um, Half of you will drop out because it was true. But then he said, out of that half, half of you will go to college. And he said, if I'm lucky, one of you will get a PhD. And I always tell people, I didn't know what a PhD was, but I remember thinking to myself, like, I want that PhD, even if only one of us is getting it, right? Now, transitioning to your college education, um, you know, you just mentioned your your primary and your secondary education and Um, you know, the schools were underfunded, but yet you were going to all these additional programs and you got to interact with some elite students that were planning on going to Harvard and going to these elite schools. And they were the ones who told you like, well, here you are with us. So you should apply. And then you had your counselor who said, oh no, you know, do not apply to these schools. (laughs) And then you had the gumption to go against this person, you know, this professional and say like, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try, I'm gonna do it all on my own. I'm gonna apply to 13 schools on my own. Mm -hmm. You said you got into 10. Yeah, so I ended up going to Princeton um, for undergrad. And I later went to Teachers College Columbia for my master's, um, and then finally UCLA for my PhD. And as as you pointed out, Princeton was alienating and, um, you know, it uh, was almost spirit murdering um, because it was extremely elitist. Um, You know, people want to say, oh, these elite schools, as if it's something good. Elitism is not a good thing. (laughs) Elitism is harmful and, um, and painful for, especially for those of us who have been allowed in students legacy of a lot without the legacy a lot of people have their parents went to Princeton their their siblings go yeah so you know people love to uh be anti-affirmative action but you know the elite elitist schools have wonderful affirmative action for legacy students there's a great book called pedigree that talks about how these elite firms recruit just from Princeton and and other similar Ivy Leagues 
Absolutely. And I had classmates that were, you know, anthropology majors or religion majors that went to business school, went to med school, (laughs) went to work on Wall Street. Right. And so um, those those things are true. But the way that these Ivy Leagues work is that they'll only take, you know, the one. Um, what I did learn at Princeton that was that is key, and to this day, I am really grateful for, is the power of student organizations, the power of student activism, and people of color spaces. As Bell Hooks talks about, right, to, to have like that, um, that strengths in the margin, right? So, so what the work of, of being a feminist and, and a person of color in the margins brings great strength, and I learned that at Princeton. And so I'm, I, I've carried that on to my career now. Um, why don't you talk about the Raza women first? Because we have that article uh, to discuss okay. how that led. What is Raza women and how did that lead to Las Vegas? So again, when I went to Los Angeles, um, there was so much activism. Um, and what was really exciting about it was that it became more focused, right? So it wasn't just black and brown solidarity, but it was Chicana, Latina, woman-centered, and then eventually um, queer-centered social movement work. So I did what they call participatory action research, but I think I did my own kind of action research and I would call it a mujerista action research. It's a Chicana feminist Latina um, activist identity. And it's basically an intersectional identity. And this is something that I write about um, in, in my article, are all, are all Raza women queer? And so then when you moved to Las Vegas, you, you were bringing this activism experience and this student organization, and then you enter this different kind of, you know, geographic context. Um, so how did the Las Vegas activist crew develop? And so it was a pleasant surprise when I got there and there was both um, Latin, Latinx, Chicanx and feminist and queer and immigrant communities that were doing kind of um, I sometimes isolated activism. And um, they also need, you know, needed lots of labor to meet the needs of people on the strip. Um, so they had a lot of Latino uh, workers, laborers, and Asian laborers. Um, and and so my boss, who had been from California, um, so I came there in 2004, started kind of paying attention to the activism because I knew I still wanted to study activism. I knew I wanted to be a part of it because similar to Los Angeles, I believe that my research needs to be rooted in the community. In 2006, when the nationwide wide immigrant rights movement took, you know, um, like flared up because of the racist legislation that was being pushed forward. Um, Students, high school students and middle school students walked out and you were there with us uh, very soon after. I think you were there for the second protest. This was exactly what I had been um, waiting for in, in terms of documenting the experiences of activists, feminist, queer, immigrant rights activists in Las Vegas. And, um, and so the, I just basically studied them for the next um, 10 to 15 years. I wrote a few articles. I have several things that I want to continue to publish. There's another one called Making It Safe to Be Queer. Um, and then finally, oh, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. And then um, the activist crew, this is where we introduce the term citizenism. So now you've come full circle. Now you're, you're really a mentor. You've you spent all these uh, time in Las Vegas and now you're back in LA in a different context in different school. And so how has your, your story you know, evolved now that you're back in, in LA again? They, we were growing up together. So I, I, I was a brand new assistant professor. So I feel really honored, one, because um, this idea of mentorship is so key. But I also think I do mujerista mentorship. It's a special kind of mentorship that is rooted in what I learned from Raza Women the students that we're getting to work with and the fact that these are the students that I've always dreamed of serving, right? They're the students that are just like 
people like me who didn't always have access and who are historically being pushed out. They were maybe the few people who made it through and but many of their family members were indeed pushed out and didn't make it to even into higher education. So it's really powerful to be able to be in the classroom with them today. It reminds me, you know, we had another activist um, episode in Las Vegas when your women's studies program was under uh, budget uh, cuts potentially. And so the students really came together to organize to fight that. Her name is Irina Barrera and she's going to share her testimony about why she supports women's studies here at UNLV. Not only has this department itself helped me find a space at this university, but also some individuals in particular. Dr. Anita Rabia, who is a friend and mentor, or a woman mentor, has guided, through, has guided me through my academics here at UNLV. With Dr. Rabia's help and a few UNLV student organizations that I've gotten involved with, I have had numerous opportunities to put on events and conferences on campus that promote diversity and that bring high school students to UNLV. It is important that universities like UNLV start funding and placing importance on diversity-led departments, programs, because I know that I personally would have felt disconnected and underrepresented here at UNLV if it wasn't for the Women's Studies Department and faculty. Thank you. Absolutely. And thank you for being there to document that. And that's why I have such deep resonance with anybody who is at the institutional level who is also being shut down and, and not allowed to like do the work that they're doing. And Yes, absolutely. Well, it's been such a pleasure talking to you today and really going over your story, your personal education and all this scholarship and activism that have been a part of your life and all these lives and networks that you've really been a part of. So it's an honor to, uh, to talk to you and to really reflect on the activism and the work that you've um, you know, put out into the world. Thank you, Beverly. And I'm also really honored. I'm honored first and foremost by our friendship, um, by the growth and love that well, we've been able to- Out of women's studies and ethnic exactly. activism and immigrant rights activism. Uh, but we found each other and we, we connected on our sense of wanting to make a change through this work. So thank you for being my friend. Thank you for uh, being there with me in Las Vegas to document me and my students' struggle and, and for, for documenting my, my work, my academic work, and for walking this path with me. I've, I've really appreciated this friendship. It, it means so much to me. Yes, me too. All right, well, thank you. And uh, we'll leave it there. Thank you.